are going to go ahead and get started for today. Thanks for being here. We're really glad that you're here and welcome to the Southern IPM Hour. Um, and this one is really exciting because I know it's something that I don't know a lot about, and that's IPM and T. Um, the Southern IPM Hour is presented by the Southern IPM Center, where we present research issues and programs in integrated pest management from the Southern region through this webinar series. And the IPM Hour takes place on the first Wednesday of the month, usually at 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Kayla Watson. I'm the Communication Director of the Southern IPM Center, housed at NC State and University of Georgia. And we have a mission to coordinate IPM across the region. We are also one of four regional IPM centers supported by USDA NIFA Crop Protection and Pest Management Regional Coordination Program. So for the webinar today, we're going to be testing your knowledge of IPMNT as we go. So be on the lookout for those questions to pop up on your screen. And if you have any questions for the speaker as we go throughout the talk, we'll be answering those questions at the end. But if you're like me and you might forget your question, <laughs> feel free to type those questions into the Q&A located on your Zoom control panel. And our speaker today which we are so happy to have is Lorena Lopez, and she's going to be speaking with us about IPM and T. And Lorena is an agricultural entomologist at the Eastern Shore Agricultural Research and Extension Center in Virginia, and her research focuses on the development and application of sustainable management techniques for insect and mite pests in vegetable and fruit production systems. So welcome, Lorena, and we are so glad that you're here. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here and thank you for the introduction, Kala. Um, as you mentioned, um, my research focus is integrated pest management in vegetables and fruits such as strawberries and now tea, uh, which is actually an ornamental, but uh, it's for food uh, consumption. I'm currently in Virginia Tech, but I spend the last decade in Florida, uh, working in vegetables and fruits. And now I've been here in Virginia Tech for a little bit more than a year. And today I'm going to give you a um, quick overview of tea production, uh, the different types of tea that you can actually see in the market and the pest complex the, around tea plantings, the different pest management pest management options that we have, the challenges of growing teas, ongoing and upcoming research that we're doing here in Virginia. I'll give you some takeaway uh, messages. And lastly, I'm gonna finish with some resources if you wanna know more about tea production in the US. But before we proceed, um, I'm going to give uh, Kyla a minute that she's going to send us some questions about tea before we start. So the first thing that we're asking just to kind of get you used to doing these questions is what is your favorite kind of tea? And it might not be on here, um, but if it is, you can just do that real quick. So I'll give you a second to answer that. Oh, it looks like black and green tea are, are neck and neck here. Okay, it looks like black tea uh, very narrowly won out. Would you like to go to the next nice. question now, Lorena? Yes, please, because <laughs> I don't want to answer, to give you the answer before the quiz. Okay, now this question is, what country is the largest producer of tea? So I'm gonna talk about this, but I wanna know what you actually think and your trivia on tea. All right. It looks like uh, everybody got it right. <laughs> so it is China. Yes, I, I wasn't able to see the, re the responses, but yeah, if you said China, you were correct. 
Can you see it now? No. Hmm. Okay. So yeah, if you said China, you're correct. But before going there, I want to talk a little bit about tea production in the world. So actually, tea is one of the world's oldest beverages. It's the most consumed drink in the world after water. And since the 1950s, the acreage of tea in the world increased steadily until the 2000s. In the 2000s, the acreage uh, increase it started to slow down a little bit, but it continued to go up in most of the producing countries in the world. As you can see here, uh, this is because in the 1980s with the baby boomer generation, it, become, it became more popular. And uh, in the millennial generation, uh, the organic tea is actually uh, what became more popular and also the green tea. So you saw the preferences here in this quiz was green and also black tea. And there's a reason for that. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit. But the world tea production increased in the last decade by 3.5% annually to reach more than 6 million tons in 2020. And the growth in global tea demand was driven by the expansion of production in China, which increased by 6.3% from 1.6 million tons in 2011 to, the, to 2.9 million tons in 2012 only in China. And this was a response of an unprecedented war, uh, growth in domestic demand. Uh, and this was also reinforced during um, the COVID-19 pandemic. So even before that, there was a shift to uh, drinking less tea outdoors and drinking more at home. And that is what created um, an increase in demand, especially in, in China. But the producing areas in the entire world are, are concentrated in the tropical and subtropical areas. So the spots that you see here are just to show you where you can find uh, producing farms. Uh, the size does not correspond to the acreage. It's just to show you where, where right now um, there are farms producing uh, tea. And worldwide, black tea production increased by 2.4 um, annually, whereas green tea increased 4.5 over the last decade. And actually this was a shift because before that decade, uh, before the 2000s, um, the black tea was the more popular one and the one that uh, continuously increased uh, every year. So as I mentioned, green tea in the last one or two decades have become more popular and more popular to now, um, uh, be more, continue to be more um, produced in the world than black tea. But black tea continue to be a um, main commodity, a main production. And um, the tea is produced on 46 countries across Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And in many of the developing countries that you see here, it contributes immensely to rural develop, development and um, poverty reduction. And actually 60% of world production, it's, based, it's made by small holders. So it's a resource for a lot of uh, small holders and famil in family farms around the world. Tea is one of the most important cash crops in the world, but not only for developing countries, but also for developed countries like China, which is actually the main producer of tea in the world with 46.6% production in 2020, which is uh, 2.9 million tons, followed by India with 20% of world production. And these two are not only 
the largest producers in the world, but also the largest consumers. So they produce and also consume the tea that they grow. Uh, they also export a lot of the tea, but in the case of China, as I mentioned, it has increased in the last decade, but it has been different for India. There was a decline in the last few years due to unfavorable uh, weather conditions. And also this country in particular was affected by COVID-19. And I said this country because the third largest um, producer and also the largest exporter of tea, which is Kenya, uh, in increase their production 24% in 2020. So they were selling at a better price, probably because the largest, the second largest producer, India, has a decline. They took advantage of this market, of this niche. They, they didn't have any unfavorable conditions. And for a lot of other reasons, they were benefit on tea production in 2020. Uh, Sri Lanka is the fourth producer in the world, but it was affected by COVID-19 uh, also, but labor short, uh, shortage. And also in 2020, it was affected by um, ban on agrochemicals that limit them, limit them only to use uh, organic uh, inputs. And also they have issues that, but that was on 2021. Um, as I mentioned, tea smallholders are responsible for 60% of world production. And production in China continued to increase um, in 2021. But as I mentioned, if you answered China as the largest producer, you were right. But also Japan, it's a big producer, Vietnam and um, um, South Korea. Okay, but what about the United States? We're gonna, I'm gonna get there. In the case of the United States, we're a big consumer. Here at, in America, we're a big consumer of tea, and the most popular one is black tea. So that's why I mentioned it makes sense. As I mentioned in the last decade, green tea has become more popular, especially because they have a lot of uh, health benefits that have been highlighted in the last few years. Um, and 75 to 80% total consumption, it's iced tea, not hot tea. And that's here in the US. 16% uh, is um, green tea. It's that it's consumed here, it's green tea. And then 1% is oolong, white and dark tea and other teas. But before we move forward, uh, Kayla is going to send another question before I give the answer. Um, I would like to know what you think. So this one's a true false question. And it is white, green, black, and maca tea are produced from different plant species, true or false? All right. Looks like we have seven people that said true and 10 people that said false. If you said false, then you're correct. They actually come from the same plan, Camellia sinensis. And it's just different parts of the plant. And I'm gonna show, I'm gonna explain that a little bit uh, in, a mo in a moment. But, Different areas of the U.S. and different regions in the entire world focus on the production of these different types of tea, not only because they require different conditions, but there are also different varieties that, are, that have been produced and breed for these different types of tea. And in the case of the production in the U.S., it's just in recent years that growers have become interested on 
producing tea and well not really recent years because it takes years for you to establish tea plants but in the last few decades it had become uh more popular to grow tea here in the U.S. and you can see this is a map from 2017 and we're finding 15 states with reported tea farms here in the U.S. and Hawaii for being so small have a bunch of them they have had a history now of tea production and they're actually some of the few um, reports of pest management and tea practices come from Hawaii. But you can see that also we have on the Western coast, a few plants, but most of them, a few farms, most of them are at the East coast. But this is not an official record. It's actually a blog. This comes from a blog that is just trying to find out and pinpoint where are these farms. So there is no way that we could confirm if all these farms are actually active now and producing. What we do know is that based on the information is that you see the variation in size. There's no only variation in size from 0.5 0.5 acres to 196 acres, which is actually a farm in South Carolina, which is now a tourist uh, place. No, it's not producing. But there's also a variety of uh, production outputs, not only for consumption, drinking the tea, but also to do um, care products like soaps, shampoos, uh, and other skin products uh, like the farm that we have here in Virginia, which is called Virginia's first tea farm. But again, there are very few, there are very few documents that actually have updated um, information about these farms in the US and quantified the size and also uh, the practices on these farms. And this is how they look, some of them look. The one in the bottom is actually a picture from the um, Virginia's first tea farm. And the one at the top is the one from the Great Mississippi Tea Company, which is a specialized in what a lot of growers here call a specialty tea, which is a more unprocessed tea that it's, it can or cannot be me uh, mechanically harvested, but it's, it's not for retail sales is more for direct consumption. And then this picture is for a tea planting in, in Hawaii, where they're actually using plastic for to suppress weeds. So there are different types of uh, scenarios here. You can see they're in plain surfaces, uh, no shade, um, and in plain sun. But this is very different than what we see in tea fields in Asian and Afri African countries. And remember, this is where actually, this is where actually the Camellia sinensis uh, species come from, somewhere in Asia. China says that it was originated there, but then some other people said it was originated in India. It's actually, uh, it's not very, it's not really confirmed where it comes from, but there is a long tradition of growing and consuming tea in these Asian countries. And they have developed different protocols. They have a lot of history of how to grow uh, these plants in hills mostly with well-trained soils and acidic soils with different levels of shade for production. And again, different areas for different types of, of, of tea. If it's either black, white, oolong, or matcha tea um so and there are also different types of processing times and processing steps for these different types of 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 tea uh, that are produced uh, around the world i just wanted to show you here the different the main steps to process tea from harvest to table with the rain it's basic it's very important to dry the leaves, to oxidate, depending on, I'm not gonna go into details with it, but depending on the, um, 
length of each of these tabs um, it's is the result of the tea, the flavor, and also the different types of, of tea that you can find in the market. So as I mentioned, I'm just gonna talk about these three briefly, which are the main ones. There are a lot of other types of tea and they different. They're, they are different based on the processing times. Also, what part of the plant they are, they are harvest from and what time of the year they're harvest at. So that it's would determine what type of tea it's gonna, be, it's gonna be, how is it going to taste, how is it going to look, what color is it going to have. So if you're harvesting, assume that this is a tea plant. If you're harvesting from the top part of the plant, the unopened buds and the youngest leaves, those are for usually for white tea. Sometimes it's called unprocessed tea because it doesn't need oxidation process or rolling, which is actually need, needed for green tea. Green tea is harvested from young leaves, not unopened, but it's still young leaves that require more time to process, but still at low heat. They need heat activation and they have oxidation, but they're less oxidized than white tea and black tea. And they are also called uh, semi-fermented tea for the green tea and non-fermented tea, uh, depending on the processing. And lastly, black tea are usually mechanically harvested um, from the lower part of the plant. They're fully oxidized, rolling is, is required, so they need more time, higher heat, uh, to gain different flavors and different colors that we can find in our iced teas and our black teas. Okay, so this is a diagram that explains a little bit where do you have to harvest if you want these different types of tea, but not only it changes based on the plant, but also what time of the year you need to harvest will vary to, for you to produce these different types of tea, what time of the day, and temperature you need, you need, uh, it's gonna be different for each of these types of tree, but not only for production, but also because the vertical distribution is important for what type of pests are you going to find. So that's what I was trying to get to. If you're producing different types of, of tea, you're gonna have probably a different complex and your main pests may be different if you're producing white tea versus black tea. If you're mechanically harvesting, you may have different pest issues that if you're plucking by hand. So all those things are important. So the vertical distribution on the plant is important for pest infestation, plant phenology, what time in the season, what is the age of the plants. The plants in establishments go from one year to fourth year of the, uh, one-year-old plants to four-year-old plants. Starting four-year-old plants can be harvested, but one to four year, the plants are more susceptible to a lot of pests. They continue to be susceptible, but the establishment time is very important. Geographic uh, region is important because it, uh, geographical variation in pest diversity exists uh, due to climate change, changes in altitude, age of the plant, uh, microclimate, cultivation practices. As I mentioned, organic production has become more popular. So you may be limited to uh, certain chemical inputs. Uh, you may have a variation of cultural practices like sanitation, intercropping. All of those things are going to have an effect on your decision of what pest management practices are going to be more suitable for your a tea plantation, uh, plantings. So not only these things are important, but also depending on where you are, what country and what part in the US you are, this is the pest complex is gonna change. In Asian countries, there it's a different pest complex than here. There's actually a lot of arthropods associated with tea plants, with Camellia sinensis. 
there have been over a thousand arthropod species reported to be associated with the plant. That's a mix of pests and natural enemies. Uh, and only in China, eight, more than 800 species of insects and mites infest, um, inhabit uh, tea plantations. But as you see here, in Asian countries, the pets complex, the main pests and concerns may be very different. They have a lot of Lepidoptera pests that are a major problem. Uh, the tea mosquito bug is a major problem as, long as, leaf, as well as leaf hoppers. Mites also. But here we also have, and I'm giving the, an example of Hawaii because that's where we have more documentation of tea plantations. We also have some beetle, beetle pests Lepidopteran pests, uh, we have a lot of white flies, not a lot, but a few white flies, a lot of, a lot of scales that are also sometimes problematic on Asian countries. And I'm going to talk about a little bit about them, but I'm gonna focus, I'm gonna try to narrow it down to the main pests that you can find in Camellia in the east of the US. Um, because that's the area where we wanna, um, I'm gonna focus. And this is actually a compilation of different arthropod pests that you can find on South Carolina. And it's gonna be similar for other Eastern states where we're growing tea. And is here you can see the months of the year. And these are uh, some of the major pests. P denotes a peak on the population. And what this is telling us is that these different pests could be some of them like these scales could be throughout the year, depending on where in the East Coast you are. And the ones on the red, um, on the red squares are the ones that I'm going to uh, talk a little bit more about. So the arbor scales are a main pass in the in tea plantations on the East Coast of the US, mostly tea scale and camellia scale. There are many other scales that you can find in tea plantations, but these are the two main concerns in this area. They can infest young and mature leaves, and they have similar life cycles. The adults have uh, shells that are made of wax, skin, and fecal material. Or they are hardened. In the case of the tea scale, they, have, they are brown and have one single rich, uh, rich shells. Whereas the adults of the camellia scale are more uh, are darker, um, they are flattened and elongated, and they are bigger than the T scales. But they both produce. Um, they are both undergo four instars as immatures, and the first instars are coral are called crawlers. They are soft-bodied and mobile, and those are the ones that move to new healthy plants and new healthy leads. And it can be the emergence of the first insert can last over a month. And this is the best time for growers to treat because that's when the insecticides are going to actually kill because they haven't developed, kill the crawlers. They haven't developed this waxy hardened shell. So monitoring early in spring, which is when we start seeing these scales here in the East Coast, is vital to schedule appropriate um, insecticide applications, okay? They take both 60 to 70 days to undergo the life cycle from egg to, to adult. And in the case of the T scales, they go, they can have three generations per year, whereas the camellia scale four to five per year. They prefer, they establish on the underside of the leaves and these ones do not produce honeydew, okay? Uh, but this is the damage that they cause. They accumulate so, so much that they uh, cause these chlorotic spots on the upper side of the leaves and in the lower side of the leaves, they accumulate the hard shells and the sheds and they, uh, they create problems for the, for the leaves. The soft scales, there's one that it's prominent here in the East Coast. Again, there are more of this, but I'm going to talk about the cottony camellia scale. 
Uh, this one infests mainly younger leaves. Uh, they cause, just like har uh, hardened scales, armor scales, leaf distortion and stunted plants. They are yellowish and brownish margins, but they are not hardened. Their shells are not hardened like the armor scales. They also have crawlers that are dispersive. And in the case of Virginia, the crawlers emerge in June, whereas the armor scales emerge between February and April. So we need to weekly scout for these scales because these are major pests of, of tea. The difference of these subscales is that these ones do produce honeydew. So is this a sugary secretion and they drop it on the leaves and the accumulation of that uh, produces sooty malt, which are these uh, on the top picture are these uh, uh, black patches on the leaves that interferes with photosynthesis. And that's an actually a fungal disease that affects greatly the plant. Another insect that it's also a pest and also produce honeydew and contributes to the proliferation of sooty mold are aphids. There are actually multiple species of aphids that can be found on tea on this side of the US. Most of the ones that you can find, the most commonly ones are the green peach aphid, the tea aphid, or that's also known as brown citrus aphid, and the melon aphid. These are major, especially melon aphid and green peach aphid can be found in a lot of vegetable ornamentals and fruit crops. Um, they infest younger leaves. I'm gonna show you uh, how they look. Uh, they cause leaf distortion very quickly and they stun the plants and they can kill them because the leaves start dropping. And especially when this mold, they start to accumulate. And these are an issue in on indoor and outdoor tea plants. And this is how they look. So they start accumulating and they curl the leaves. So these leaves are not, are not good for producing any type of white or green tea. And they concentrate on the new shoots. Also, we can find thrips, different types of thrips, like flower thrips, which are the frankly yellow species, but they're, no, they're usually not a problem. So it's rare to treat with insecticides for frankly, frankly yellow species flower thrips. However, chili thrips feed on the leaves. And these invasive species have become a problematic pest of a lot of fruit, vegetables, and ornamental plants. And it, it as far as I know, it hasn't been reported to uh, for tea plantings here, but it has been reported in Louisiana, affecting greatly the yields of tea plantations there. They are smaller than flower thrips. They feed mostly on young leaves, which is the part that a lot of producers need for harvest. And they can go up to like 15 generations per year. They can undergo a life cycle in two weeks. They have four life stages and their females insert the eggs on the tissue of the leaf. They can lay between uh, up to 200 eggs in their lifespan. So they're very problematic. This is not the damage that they cause on tea. This is in blueberries actually. But there is very little documented about the actual damage on tea. But this is the damage that they generally pose, they, ca they cause on, on the new shoots. They cause coralline of the leaves and this uh, browning on the edges, on the veins. This is a map from 2017, 2018 of the Shilotrip distribution, but this is actually not updated. Because again, these are very, very hard to find the updated map for this, but they have actually been detected in Virginia several times. And in most of the ones that said it has been intercepted, it has already been declared as established. So it is not, it is not going to be a surprise when we can when we find reports of chili trips on tea plantations in all these East Coast and in Virginia as well, because it's just a matter of time for them to establish, unfortunately. But we also have a lot of my pests in tea. As I mentioned, a lot of 
my, uh, of pets love this um, this crop. And there are three main spider mite species that affect uh, Camellia sinensis. The red spider mite, uh, there are a lot of studies on their damage of tea plantains, especially on Asian countries. It is a main pest. But here in the US, the southern red mite is the main, the main problem followed by two spotted spider mites. A two spotted spider mite, it's, it's a common pest in a lot of vegetables and fruits. Southern red mites, it's a common pest on ornamental crops. But they have similar life cycles. They all these, uh, especially southern red mite, two spotted spider mite, love hot and dry conditions. Uh, they are optimal for their development. Also for red spider, uh, red spider mite, they infest mostly mature leaves and they continue going up as the plant growth uh, grows. Uh, they cause purple and bronze leaves, dryness, roughening, and the accumulation of their sheds. Uh, made the underside of the leaves uh, white just because they're shedding constantly and they accumulate there. Actually, they can be found both on the upper and lower side of the leaves and you can find different symptoms. You can find chlorotic um, uh, patches like on the bottom part and stippling, but you can also, especially the southern red mite causes leaf bronzing as you see in the top part. But both of them, when there are severe infestations that are unattended, are going to cause flower drops, leaf drops, and they, they're going to kill the plant for sure if unattended under the, on the optimal conditions for these pests. We also have issues with broad mites, also called yellow tea mite, but this is mostly on uh, protective structures, unlike spider mites, which can be found on open field or greenhouse. This one is mostly, these broad mite issues are mostly on protector structures, which is a problem for the growers that are trying to sell seedlings uh, because they infest the younger, the younger leaves. So they cause this curling and this uh, leaf distortion as you see in the top bottom, but they also bronze the leaves underneath, like you see in the bottom and the curling on the top. Um, they are half the size of the spider mites. So the spider mites, you can see them with the naked eye, but it's very hard to see broad mites with the naked eyes. Usually you can see them when there are large populations on the plants and the damage is already done and it's really hard to manage them at that time. So monitoring constantly and having preventive methods of control is very important for this type of pest. And the other mite that is very problematic and that it's, it's causing a lot of issues, not only here in the US, but also in uh, Asian countries and African countries like Kenya um, is the purple tea mite. This is an areophyte mite. So it's even smaller than the broad mite that I show, but they have similar symptoms. So it's hard to differentiate because they also bronze and cause this rusting of the leaves underneath, like you see there. Uh, it's also very hard to see, so it's hard to differentiate. Is it broad mites or is it purple tea mite? Uh, you need to have a microscope to actually see these mites. So most of the times you need to send samples to confirm identification of what is the issue. And unfortunately, when you see the symptoms in the plan, it's probably, it's probably too late for that plant because there's probably a large population on the plant. These might attack older leaves and they show a preference for the upper side of the leaf and they meet rib and margins. Uh, but I'm going to talk to you about uh, some methods to, to go after these mites and to, to suppress these mites. So that's going to be including the pest management option. So to control most of these pests that I mentioned, cultural practices, which usually are used for pre as preventative uh, tactics are very important. That includes sanitation, 
like cleaning and removing any weeds, debris, all plants and infested plants. That's very important. Pruning your plants every single year. Most of, of plantings need one to two year um, pruning times during the year, depending on the type of production that you're, you're using them for. Uh, monitoring is vital. Weekly monitoring during spring, summer, and fall, because as I mentioned, you're gonna have different types, different pests throughout the year and different pests in the different parts of the plant. So yellow sticky cars are very useful to monitor trips, also scales during the time where the crawlers are emerging because they can be this, they can be moved through wind as well. Also tapping on a cloth or a white paper to check for, for thrips is very useful. So monitoring tactics is very, very important. But in the case of scales, you also need to monitor by using in the field or collecting some leaves. It's very important to understand the pest biology. As I mentioned, you need to know where, where you can find the pests at what times in the year and what different stages you need to monitor the most and are going to be effectively killed by your chemical inputs or the natural enemies that you have in the field and different practices. So this is important for you to put in place an integrated pest management. Integrated pest management program means the combination of all these things I'm, I'm, I'm mentioning. Cultural practices, monitoring, the use of thresholds, the use of chemicals, the use of natural enemies if you're releasing are the biological control services that the ones that you already have in the field are provided. Taking into account all these tactics is what we call integrated pest management and is what we want to achieve for tea plantations here in the US. There are a lot of protocols that are in place and they're effectively used. Um, a lot of programs, IPM programs for China, for South Korea, for Japan, because they have a long journey of growing tea. We're just starting this and we have different types of uh, conditions. So we need, we, need to, we need to establish what are our best uh, programs, IPM programs for this location, for our country. But we also need to establish economic thresholds. There are some established for China. And when I said economic thresholds, I'm referring to the number of pests, the number, the number of insects or the number of mites on a unit of area of my plant that it's going to, at which I need to take action. Otherwise I'm going to have gill losses. So the number of insects, at which I need to do something, either a spray or prune or whatever to avoid gill losses. That's what economic threshold is. And we have some thresholds for aphids, reps, and mites that we can see here, but these are made in China. There are different conditions. There are different uh, regions. There are different pest communities. So can we actually trust these, these thresholds? Well, it's the only reference that most of growers have here. So a lot of growers are using them, but ideally we need to evaluate, not reinvent the wheel, evaluate if these thresholds will work for growers here in the US or not. And is it gonna work for the East Coast or the West Coast uh, growers? That's what we need to come from because they're very, very different geographic locations. And we have, we have multiple insecticide and miticide options. If we need to get there, if we find thresholds, if we find that we're having severe uh, infestations, this is just a few of the options, the chemical options that we have to control the pests that I just mentioned. But we need to be we need to be aware that the overuse of um, pesticides can lead to resurgence of primary pests and also secondary 
pest outbreaks. This has been demonstrated in tea plantations already in Asian countries. So we can establish IPM programs that are diversified in tactics to avoid this kind of issues. Also because some groups like the pyrethroids here can cause um, aphid and mite outbreaks in some locations. Also the group uh, four are, are highly toxic to pollinators if not sprayed correctly. So we, know, we need to be aware of the overuse of uh, these chemical options in our tea plantations, because it's not that we cannot use them and we shouldn't use it, it's not that, it's that we can complement the use of chemical options and especially favor the use of low risk pesticides and the, their combinations with other miticide and insecticide alternatives, like the use of predatory mites. There are predatory mites that are used in fruit crops and vegetable crops that could be released to against the spider mite pests that we have here, and also broad mites and aerophyte mites. The Phytocellus persimilis is an option that it's being used, especially in strawberries, and it's a very good uh, biological control agent of spider mites because it's a uh, it's um obligatory predator of these mites. We also have Neoceles californicus, which is a generalist predator, which means it can feed on spider mite strips, uh, pest mites, and a variety of other prey. But this is not the only one, the only generalist predator. There are some other examples like Neoceles cucumeris. This is just an example. There are options there of natural enemies. But Releasing biological control agents is, is not the only option that we have for biological control or IPM programs. We can also promote the conservation of the natural enemies that we have in the field. But do we have records of natural enemies in our tea plantations in the US? We don't have that much information regarding that. It's very limited. And as I mentioned, most of it comes from Hawaii, which is another different microclimate to continental US. But this is pretty much what we what has been reported in Asian countries and what we've seen in some of the tea plantations here. These are very common uh, natural enemy, commonly found natural enemies in vegetables and fruits as well. And we find them in tea. They go after thrifts, they go after some scale uh, species and some of the pests that I mentioned here, aphids. Uh, so it's very important to create a habitats like flowering, um, flowering areas and intercropping to promote and conserve these natural enemies. But as I have mentioned during the entire presentation, we have a lot of challenges here in the US for tea production because uh, we're, growers are mainly using practices from other countries. Uh, there, it's a lack of guideline, guidelines on how to produce uh, plants in the greenhouse, how to minimize pest contaminations as, as these plants are distributed throughout the country, as these plants are coming from other countries because most of their art growers are getting their plants from other countries and they're starting to grow in them here in greenhouse. How can we help them optimize those productions and take care of those plants? What are the most problematic pests that we have on the plant establishment period, which is the, the first and fourth year of, of the plants in the field or in the greenhouse? if you're producing them in the greenhouse or under product, uh, protector structures. For the different uh, types of tea, first of all, what, we need more information about what teas are being produced here in the US and what markets are they going from? Are they actually going to consumer uh, for, for drinking tea? Or as I mentioned before, for other types of products like soaps, shampoos, on some other um, caring products. Um, and also besides the chemical inputs, what other 
alternatives of pest management do we have? Biological control is one of them, but also biopesticides. What biopesticides, what low risk or selective chemical inputs can I use together with biological control and together with sanitation and cultural practices that could help growers in the US improve their, their production and their pest management programs. So these are the challenges that we're facing. So basically we need pest management programs tailored for US tea production. And that's what we're trying to work on Virginia. Here at the Eastern Shore AREC, we started this year establishing um, uh, plantings of tea. Uh, this is just the first tree of what we want to have nine rows with three different varieties of tea. These are what you find here is um, covered with cloths just because we want to also evaluate uh, how the row covers can promote the plant establishment. I, I'm going to see what pests are going to be showing on this field and how, how can I co uh, control them? What are the cha other challenges that could uh, limit our establishment? And this is a collaboration between the entomology and the horticulture uh, laboratory at this uh, research station in Painter, Virginia, where we uh, got the plants, one year old plants, which are the ones on the top, and then we planted them under these low shaded tunnels um, this year. And we started to see what are going to be the biggest challenge. Right now, aphids has been our major, major concern because it has been really hard to keep them off the greenhouse plants and also the outdoor plants. And the horticulture department is interested on in knowing what is the effect of shading on this plant, especially because here we have a lot of winds and a lot of sun that could dry and burn these tiny little uh, plants. As I mentioned, uh, in Asian countries, these are usually grown in hills, not in flat, uh, in flat areas. And they have different degrees of shade. So we're, we're going to see what's the effect of these shades here. Also, they have an effect on, especially on pest mites. We've seen in, in other areas, in other countries, that the purple tea mite, it shows uh, less numbers and less damage when they, there is shade in the plants, whereas we can find more spider mites. So it can limit sun, it can limit, um, up, um, incoming pests, but they can also create a microclimate that could be inducive of pests. And that is what we are um, conducting on Virginia. Our main goals in this stage of our trials here is plant establishment, where the most problematic pests and biological control, and how shade, how different. Um, cultural practices, not cultural practices, cultivation practices, like different types of irrigation, fertilization and shade, it's going to affect the pex complex around these tea plants here in Virginia. And we also want to do this to get, to develop a pest management program for Virginia growers and the East Coast growers, tea growers. We're trying to do this in conjunction with the Southern IPM Center. And the plan is to start getting uh, growers together. We're working with extension agents like Beth, Beth Sastre uh, here in Virginia and also plant pathologists like me, Nisu Honita, to start, and the horticulturist, Emmanuel Torres that I just show, to have a multidisciplinary team and put together a pest management strategic plan for tea in this area. This is our goal to start contributing to the knowledge about tea production in the US. Um, so to finalize, I want to summarize what I've, what I've said so far. So first, tea is the most consumed, consumed drink in the world after water. So this makes it a very, very important um, cash crop in the entire world. It's also 
an import, a, the U.S. is an important consumer of tea. And there is a lot of interest in the U.S. for the expansion of tea production and diversification, which means different types of product, uh, production practices. And, and there is a lot of interest of having guidelines placed for each of these different regions of the U.S. The scales of the spider mites have been reported so far in North Carolina and Virginia as the main pest of tea in landscapes, whereas the chili trips pose a risk to tea production. It has been, old, has been already demonstrated in, in plantations, in plantings on Louisiana, and we need to be prepared for that. Aphids, broad mites, and purple tea mites are important pests uh, indoors, and some of them could are not rich by insecticides, like the purple tea mites. If they are suppressed, but they need to have another, another um, tactic to suppress them um, successfully. As I mentioned, we need to have an IPM program and we're working towards that to have it one tailored for this area of the US uh, and available to growers and station agents. So we can contribute to this lack of knowledge to have more resources about uh, pest management practices for production of tea here in the U.S. These are just a few of the resources that so far you can find and have been really useful. Hopefully you get to see this presentation uh, recorded so you can save those this, um, resources. Um, about um, how to produce, not only about pest management, but how to produce and different cultivation practices for Camellia sinensis. And um, I'm always available also if you want to reach out and learn more about uh, pest management and tea production in the US. I hope this has been uh, helpful and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Lorena. And we actually do have a couple questions and I'm um, going to ask uh, Clayton Myers to ask a couple questions that he has. Uh, so go ahead, Clayton. Thanks and uh, excellent presentation, Lorena. Uh, I am curious, we of course know about some insecticides and the, the effects on pollinators. I'm curious how bloom is a part of the tea production cycle. Like what time of year do the tea plants bloom and does the bloom timing impact harvest and how does that intersect with like the insecticide choices that might be available? So that is a great question. And um, to be honest, <laughs> Um, I'm not really familiar with the blooming period, and I know what I've seen so far is that they are blooming around May on the May between May and June. That's what we've seen in North Carolina and here in Virginia. Uh, but how that can be related with pests, as I mentioned, flower thrips can be problematic, but not, not a lot of time as problematic to justify insecticide applications. So most of the time, the issues with blooming and other pests, it's for the growers that are dedicating their crops to reproduce these plants. So a lot of them here are focusing on the flowering period and collecting those seeds to produce them in the greenhouse and sell those seedlings. So not only is it depending on what type of harvest, but are you producing these plants to actually produce tea to drink or to reproduce the plants and sell them? But in that case, for example, scales are not a major issue because if you're not collecting the leaves, just the seeds, uh, so you, you wouldn't have a lot of, actually insecticides to be applied. And that was the case of one of our farms in North Carolina. They were not applying pretty much anything, just neem oils every other time because they were not producing any drinkable tea, just the seeds. Sure, that makes sense. And in terms of the leaf flushes, would most of the harvest happen after bloom in most years? Yes. Okay. After bloom. That's when they're harvesting that. So 
also some growers, and again, this varies based on the preference of the growers here. Some growers actually prune before uh, or right after uh, flower bud um, production because they don't want the plant to be investing this energy in flowers that they are not going to be using. They want them to produce more flushes and flushes because that's the part they're interested on. So some of them don't even have blooming because they are not allowing the plant to do that. That's really interesting. So if you're pruning off the blooms, uh, there's no exposure pathway. I'd be curious too, then, if there's any research on using plant growth regulators, like something like ethophon to deflower the plants, uh, if, if anyone's interested in things like that. Yes, that's a good point. Uh, actually, I haven't come across that. As I mentioned, there's very, very little information about what growers and researchers actually are doing here uh, regarding tea plantations. There is very, very little resources out there to know and very, a lot of variability between the few that you can find out there. But that is something that I'm definitely going to put on my notes because we're getting, since we mentioned that we're starting these trials on here in Virginia, we have had so many ideas from different people and so we're trying to expand our goal, our objectives to try and find, uh, to try a lot of these different methods that have been researched in other crops, but not in tea here in the U.S. yet. Great. Thank you. I have another question, but I'll defer. I know we're a little over time. And if I don't want to take up all the time, if someone else has a question. We actually do have another question, Clayton, and it, it kind of um, fits into what you're asking. And this one is actually uh, from Roger. And Roger, I'm going to let you turn on your mic if you'd like to ask your question. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Kayla. I was, uh, I know that um, often uh, site selection can make a huge difference. Like, um, and I noticed that uh, in your talk, you said that a lot of the tea is grown at higher elevations. I was wondering if anybody's done a study of uh, like, you know, bioclimatic study to try and identify where the most suitable uh, parts of the U.S. Uh, might be for uh, growing tea? That's a great question, too. Actually, I don't think that has been done. I don't think that has been done yet. Um, all I've seen from high altitudes, it's some reports from other uh, countries, not here, at least not yet. Uh, what we have, it's very basic on how, what is the distancing. There are growers that don't even know what is the appropriate distancing for these types, uh, for these areas, for the East Coast or the Western Coast. So there, I don't have an answer on that. Um, I know in Asian countries, they grow it at different um, altitudes based on what type of tea they want to produce. And also they have developed different varieties that are accustomed to different climate conditions. So there are very specialized areas for white tea in China and for green tea and for, and for um, black tea. And that's the same for South Korea, Japan, and Vietnam, for example. But here we, we have almost no, not records. There, there may be uh, some studies, but very, very few reports on that, unfortunately. Thank you very much. I know there's a, a bunch of people that do that kind of work. It would be interesting to like challenge somebody in, um, you know, um, in the geography department or whatever it is to do to do a map like that would be pretty cool. Yep. Yep. That would be really cool. Actually a lot of people was very interested on how this tea planting will do here because we're very close to the shore to the sea and there's very, very strong winds and there's no shade at all. So there's a lot of curious people and I'm curious too how it's, it's going to be hard apparently but uh, 
I think it's gonna be doable.